Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Asthma in 2021, presented by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. My name is Lorraine Alba and I'm the Director of Education for the AFA and a Certified Asthma Educator. I will be helping to facilitate today's webinar. Before we dive into our presentation, a bit of housekeeping. Attendees are in listen-only mode. Some questions have already been submitted by you, the audience, during registration for this event but please feel free to further interact by submitting general questions and comments. You can ask a question in the question feature. If you need assistance, please let us know in the chat feature. We will try to answer as many questions during this session as possible. We can only cover topics of a general nature. This information presented today is not personal medical advice, and we encourage everyone to consult with their doctor as needed. Throughout the event, we will share resources that we believe you will find helpful in both the slides and in the chat. Although we are not offering CEUs for this webinar, we can provide a certificate of completion. You can ask for this in the after webinar survey. I would like to introduce to you Kenny Mendez, Chief Executive Officer and President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Kenny? Great, thank you, Lorraine. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, our webinar today is such an important topic and we're glad to offer this resource to you. First, a little background on the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, uh, also known as AFA. <clears throat> our goal is to save lives and reduce the burden of disease for people with asthma and allergies. We do this through education, research, support, and advocacy. We have an active online patient support community and chapters in Alaska, Michigan, New England, and St. Louis. AFA's Food Allergy Division, also known as KFA, Kids with Food Allergies, provides the same support for families living with food allergies. Now a little bit about this webinar. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, or NHLBI, develops asthma guidelines in the United States. This is the first update to the guidelines in 13 years. The previous guidelines known as EPR3, which stands for Expert Panel 3, Guidelines for the Diagnosis and Management of Asthma, have not been updated since they were published in 2007. In 2015, a needs assessment was completed to determine what to update in the guidelines. Then, two committees of experts and advisors were convened to guide the process of reviewing and updating the guidelines. The result is a report which we'll cover in today's webinar. The guidelines are meant to be used by doctors, nurses, and other medical providers to guide the care they provide patients. It was published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, also known as JACI. I serve on the National Asthma and Education Prevention Program Coordinating Committee for the NHLBI. As an active member of this committee, I advocate for the voice of people with asthma to be included in the guidelines. AFA is the only patient advocacy group on this committee. As part of our ongoing commitment to improving asthma health, we are also supporting the rollout of these new guidelines. We want to help make health information clear and accessible for the asthma community. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll learn more about how the new guidelines may change your treatment. We're lucky to have Laureen and Dr. James with us today to walk you through the new guidelines. So back to you, Laureen, and thank you for having me. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Kenny, for sharing the background on how the guidelines were updated. Again, my name is Lorraine and I serve as the Director of Education for AFA. Today we are joined by Dr. John James, who is an allergist board certified in allergy, asthma, and immunology. He has been in clinical practice for 30 years and completed his fellowship in allergy, asthma, and immunology at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He joined AFA's education team as a medical specialist. Dr. James is also the President of Food Allergy Consulting and Education Services, LLC. Dr. James, we're very excited that you're presenting with us today. Welcome, and I'm gonna turn it over to you to get started. 
Thank you, Lorraine, so much. It's nice to be here. I also want to thank you and the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America for inviting me to be involved in the uh, development of this program and the presentation. There's a lot of information in the 2020 focused asthma guidelines that we're going to try to hit the highlights today. Asthma medications we'll talk about will be the inhaled corticosteroid to be used as needed versus doing it on a, a regular daily basis. Second, single maintenance and reliever therapy or SMART will be discussed in detail. We'll also talk about allergy shots or allergen immunotherapy for patients with allergic asthma. And we'll wrap it up by talking about indoor allergen reduction or environmental control measures, mainly multi-component indoor allergen reduction strategies. So the focused updates included 19 recommendations over six key areas, mainly focusing on asthma diagnosis, management and treatment using comprehensive methods. And I also mentioned allergen immunotherapy and environmental control measures. The overall goal is to improve asthma management and support informed shared decision-making between patients and their providers. So before going into uh, the new recommendations, let's have a quick asthma review. What is asthma? Many of you know this, but we'll go through this. Asthma is a chronic lung disease that causes your airways to become swollen and making it hard to breathe. It, it is a chronic disease, meaning that it, it never ever completely goes away, but it can be episodic, meaning that patients can have times where they're having asthma symptoms, but if they're controlled, they can have long periods of time where they're not having symptoms and they might have a, a flare up every now and then. So it can be, it's a disease we can recognize and treat uh, very successfully. There is no cure for asthma. Asthma can be managed uh, by three major areas. First, avoiding asthma triggers such as environmental allergens, um, paying attention to exercise and changes in the weather. Uh, and then medications, number two, to prevent and control since we have a vast array of medications that can be used and if used appropriately can control asthma symptoms. And number three, treating asthma episodes if they do occur. So what are the three main changes to the airways in an asthma patient? This diagram I like because it goes from left to right, starting with the normal airway, having minimal to no swelling, wide open airways to allow air to be breathed into the lungs, and the muscle around the airway is not tightened or constricted. Then the middle picture is a patient with asthma. They can have a thickened uh, airway, they can have more mucus, but they may not have a tightening of the airway if they're controlled and they can still get air into their lungs. But finally, it's the asthmatic airway during an attack, which can be tightened, smooth muscle, thickened walls of the airway, lots of mucus, very difficult to move air into the lungs and to the alveoli. So that this is, I like this because it kind of gives you a basic uh, picture of what asthma is like. And you can think of it like set over on the left there. Number one, swelling inside the airway. Number two, excess mucus clogging of the airway plus swelling. And number three, tightening or obstruction or squeezing of the airway, allowing, uh, not allowing the air to move in and out as it should. So common asthma triggers. Infections like the flu or the, just a regular cold virus can be a major trigger. Exercise and physical activity, allergens like, in, like pollen, pet dander, dust and mold, changes in the weather, a very common trigger, and changes in humidity. Irritants like passive tobacco smoke, strong perfumes, environmental smoke from wildfires. Reflux or GERD, GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease, can be a major trigger for asthma. And then strong emotions like crying, laughing too hard, or stress. I kind of, I want to just stress really the main three triggers that we see are infections, 
changes in the weather and exercise. So those are going to be really at the top of the list. So common asthma symptoms. The hallmark of asthma are these common symptoms that you should, all should be aware of. Coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, and chest tightness. So we spend a lot of time as healthcare providers asking about these in the history, trying to put it together. There may be a family history as well, but really focusing on what the symptoms are first before moving into diagnostic uh, testing. Asthma may lead to a medical emergency. This is the worst case scenario, really, where patients who are not being managed well with their treatment or they're not responding, they can end up in the emergency room or a hospital. And it's important to know that the clinical signs and symptoms of asthma can be the, the red flag to us so we can act quickly, manage symptoms, and prevent utilization in the emergency room and hospital. Now, asthma action plan is really important. And on the right there, you see examples of an asthma action plan. These typically are written in concert with the patient, the family, and the healthcare provider. And it has the patient's name, the date, their weight, it has their medications for asthma, and who are the contacts? Parents, other caregivers in the school, they might have a school nurse. So, and these have um, different zones here, green, yellow, and red. Green meaning that the asthma is very well controlled, minimal symptoms, and things are going well. In the yellow, it's usually a cautionary area where things could be starting up. There's a uh, viral infection, symptoms could be starting. Need to be aware of those, pay attention so we can act on those quickly. In the red zone, which is a danger area that symptoms are really significant, need to be very, actively treating those symptoms, uh, be involved with the, the healthcare provider, the parents, et cetera, to keep uh, the patient or to turn the symptoms around and keep them out of, out of the emergency room and hospital. So it's, the asthma action plan is a guide for patient self-management in concert with their healthcare provider. It explains what, when, and how to take medications, detailed signs and symptoms, especially if they're worsening, so we can act on those, and explains how to respond to an emergency. Dr. James, thank you so much for that um, great explanation about asthma action plans. And APA does have easy to use asthma action plans that are available in both English and Spanish and they're fillable forms. So they're super easy to use. And we put the link in the chat. Okay, back to you. Thanks, Lorraine. What I'll do now is go over the four types of asthma medications before getting into some of the new recommendations. So the first group of medications are quick relief medications like albuterol. They work quickly to relieve sudden asthma symptoms. They specifically relax the muscles that tighten around the airway like we showed in the diagrams, and they can be taken as needed. They should be used at the first sign of asthma symptoms. I'd also point out these uh, quick relief medications can be used prior to vigorous exercise and exertion. The second group are long-term control medicines, such as inhaled corticosteroids or ICS or standard combination medications. We'll talk about these in a little bit. So these medications reduce the swelling and extra mucus in the airways, the inflammatory part of asthma. They work up to 12 hours. They can control asthma by preventing symptoms. So that's why they're long-term controllers. And they are typically taken every day. And this brings us to combination of quick relief and controller medicines. And these are used for both quick relief and control, they work quickly to reduce sudden symptoms. They relax the muscles that tighten around the airways and they reduce the swelling and extra mucus inside the airway. And this is a new category that really was focused on in the 2020 focused updates in terms of a, 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 a controller medication that could be used for quick relief and long-term control. This is really important, and we'll, we'll focus on this a little more later. 
And finally, the biologics. I'm sure you're all hearing more and more about these medications. These can be used in people with asthma who have more persistent uh, asthma, moderate to severe in a lot of these patients. They target a cell or protein to prevent swelling inside the airway. These are typically shots or infusions given in the clinic, but some of these biologics after they're initially uh, given in the first few weeks, they can be administered at home. And these are some examples listed at the bottom of the slide here. Unfortunately, the new updates or guidelines in 2020 did not make specific recommendations about biologic therapies for asthma. Some of the data wasn't available when this was being assessed and it's it wasn't there was not formal enough uh, recommend enough data to make formal recommendations but hopefully as in the near future we'll start to hear this because these therapies are really making an impact and be, being used more and more uh, for asthma management. So now we'll go in, we'll move into the recommendations um, from the focused updates. The first one uh, really focused on the use of intermittent inhaled corticosteroids versus daily every use of these um, very important medications. So previous recommendations and, and guidelines that were, uh, that were published before recommended that ICS or inhaled corticosteroids be taken every day to control symptoms. Again, ICS reduces the swelling and mucus in the airways. You still have quick relief inhalers or medications to manage sudden symptoms. This recommendation is still in the updated guidelines and if patients are doing well on this therapy, there's really no need uh, to switch them to something else unless there's a good reason or um, or patients have or ask about it, want to try something differently, but these are still in the guidelines. So the new recommendation for inhaled corticosteroid is they can be taken as needed or intermittently to manage sudden symptoms with a quick relief medicine. So typically the quick relief medication will be taken first and followed by the inhaled corticosteroid one right after another. This is a new recommendation based on current studies and data. And if you're interested in this type of a treatment plan, definitely discuss this with the healthcare provider. So examples would be patients who are doing well with their asthma, they're going along fine, and all of a sudden they have a major trigger like an infection or some a big change in the weather. And this would be an, a, an episode or, that would benefit in these patients, they could use their inhaled corticosteroid and quick reliever to manage their symptoms for a short period of time and then go back to not having to be on that medication daily. So um, the intermittent inhaled corticosteroids are recommended for mild to persistent asthma, patients 12 years of age and older, again to use at the first sign of symptoms and during an asthma episode or flare up. So in, with the albuterol, the quick reliever, it could be two to four puffs um, as directed. And then with the ICS, one to three puffs and note every four hours per the asthma action plan and directions from your healthcare provider. This slide, summarizes the inhaled corticosteroids that alone, they're not combination therapies. These are just single agent inhaled corticosteroids and they're listed here with the uh, trade name and generics. You're familiar, a lot of you are familiar with these medications. They've been out for many years. Thank you, Dr. James. You know, taking medicines only when needed instead of every day sounds like a great option for many people. We have received a two-part question from Brad in British Columbia who wants to know, when do you know it's safe to use ICS as needed instead of daily? And is there a safe way to wean off of daily controller medications? This is a great question, Brad. And, um, 
first of all, I, before I, I'm going to give my opinion on this, and but always remember to talk with your healthcare provider as you're you're asking these questions to come up with the the final recommendation. But with when I have patients that they're on inhaled corticosteroids daily and they're doing very well in terms of they're having decreased asthma symptoms, they're sleeping through the night, they're able to exercise uh, fully, they're not going to the emergency room or hospital, they're they're doing well clinically, and the, and we also have data using peak flow rates and, and spirometry. These are the patients that I'm really interested in in considering this this treatment option to go from daily use to intermittent use of inhaled corticosteroids. And this is the this is a great a great option for healthcare providers to consider. And patients are really interested in this. They're usually the ones that actually bring it up because they're they're interested in in uh, these new recommendations. In terms of a safe way to wean off the daily controller, if they're on regular doses of daily controllers, most times we do not need to wean off, like dropping the dose over a week. We can, we can quickly go down to intermittent use versus daily use. Now, on the other hand, if patients are on very high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, and this happens in cases we can start to wean down slowly, like every 48 hours, drop the doses in half until they get down to the, uh, off the medication. So, but it's, I'm talking doses that are much higher than what the recommended doses are. But again, be in touch with your healthcare provider. Do not do this without discussing this and then recalibrating uh, the asthma action plan accordingly. Thank you very much for answering that question, Dr. James. Let's move on to the next recommendation. So this is probably the, the main uh, recommendation change and that's this garnered the most uh, interest and attention. So previously for the dual controller medications, in, in this case, it's budesonide and formoterol, which is Simbacort. It's a combination therapy inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist or LABA. These, are, these have been out for, for a long period of time and have been used successfully in ongoing management of patients with persistent asthma. The LABAs relax the smooth muscle around the airways and that can last for up to 12 hours, different from albuterol, which is a quick, quick reliever. And this was previously considered a long-term control medicine only. So the, the dosing was, was typically two puffs twice a day, every day, used in patients six years of age and older with moderate to severe asthma. It was not recommended for quick relief. I think this is the important change we're going to see in these guidelines. So the new recommendation in 2020, the published recommendations, SMART, we discussed this earlier, that's single maintenance and reliever therapy. So we'll use the example, and this is the main medication that was studied in all this lead up time with the data, budesonide and formoterol used for a quick relief inhaler instead of albuterol and the inhaled corticosteroid. This would, would allow one inhaler instead of two and has been shown to improve asthma control. Now this was studied uh, in Europe and in Canada for many years and data was accumulating to the point and then added, looked at by the expert panel. And this was again, probably one of the most, one of the major changes in the guidelines. So we have a single maintenance and reliever therapy for patients with uh, moderate, to, moderate uh, to severe persistent asthma. So the formoterol in Simbacort works differently than other long-acting beta agonists or LABAs. It's a long-acting medicine that also works quickly to open the airways. This is really the key. It works in about 15 minutes, but remember again, it can last up to 12 hours. So it's as effective as a quick relief medicine like albuterol. Other LABAs, and there are 
are other ones were not studied, so the data was not available. So that's why this was the one that's mentioned in the public published guidelines. So for smart ages and dose, and we have that this outlined here, patients four years of age and older with moderate severe persistent asthma, they can use up to eight puffs of this therapy in 24 hours. Patients 12 years of age and older with moderate to severe asthma, these, this is a little different because they're going to be using this daily, but then they can also use it as needed. So this is a it's a little confusing that this is we're trying to focus this for this talk to say, okay, they have the daily, but also it can be used as an as needed therapy up to 12 puffs in one day. So again, that's why this, this I think is the main, one of the major parts of this, these recommendations to take home as the message. Thank you, Dr. James for explaining that so well. We have a question from Linda in Garden Grove, California, and she would like to know, will insurance providers cover SMART? Okay, Lorraine, I'll go to the next slide first, and then I'll add sure. a little to that. There you go. Thank you. So this, this, is, a, this is a great question. I mean, this is practical and uh, what happens every day in the clinic. And when these first came out, I was dealing with this um, frequently. My nurses were not, because we have to work hard because these are not, insurance companies may not cover the medicines when used in this way. Simbacort may not be on your insurance formulary. There's another dual control that it has for Moderol, Delera, and it may not be covered. The FDA has not approved inhaled corticosteroids to be used intermittently. This is gonna take some time, but we're pretty confident that this is gonna happen. The FDA has not approved SMART. Again, it will be something that is gonna be accepted going forward. Hopefully the FDA will approve this. Your doctor may not be aware of the new recommendations. But finally, if you have a patient that is absolutely a candidate for this therapy, you can work with the insurance company at, to uh, generate a prior authorization. And you can demonstrate to the insurance company you have data to show why this patient is a candidate. Other therapies have failed and they may have utilization. They're, they're, ha they're just not able to be controlled. Most times you can get this approved and that is, that's wonderful. Then you have, they can be covered. Patients uh, can get, um, they don't have to pay huge amounts out of pocket. So there are ways to do it. You, it does take work. In the future, hopefully it won't be as much work. This happens with other medications we've used in asthma in the past. Thank you, Dr. James. I think you know you hit on the important point, which is to really work with your doctor and your insurance company to find the medications that are on your formulary, um, to talk about how this um, new protocol might be better to manage your asthma and get better control of your asthma and to work together. And also we put in the chat um, a link to some resources because medications can be expensive. And so we have some tips and tricks on our website on, um, on how to help you with those. So let's move on to the next question. Um, and this is also about SMART. Lola in Virginia is asking, I'm already using SMART. How many days should I use my inhaler as a quick relief um, before I call the doctor? Really good question, Lola. So this is, uh, this is a real practical clinical question as well. So first of all, it, that's where the asthma action plan, we can stress that again, because this is something that the healthcare provider hopefully can then discuss with the patient about this very issue. So I think that if a patient starts on the SMART and they're not getting better in 48 hours or you know around 48 hours, they definitely need to be in touch with their healthcare provider. If they quickly respond within 24 to 48 hours, that can be taken for typically five to seven days at max, and then they can go back to their regular asthma management plan. It is important because if, if 48 hours, they're not getting better, there are obviously some other things that we as healthcare providers can start to utilize to get the patient from their yellow back into their green or worse, the red zone, back into their yellow zone and keep those patients 
out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, get their airways working like they should. So um, this is this is a great question. They add some action plan. This shows again how important that can be in the overall management plan. Correct, and this information should be clearly written on the asthma action plan. If somebody's in the yellow zone, they should know exactly how much medication they should take and how long they can be in the yellow zone before they need to call their doctor or um, their healthcare provider. So thank you very much. All right, so let's move on to our next recommendation. One, the next area that was really important in the focus updates um, for asthma management was the issue of allergy shots or allergen immunotherapy. So allergy shots are recommended as an add-on therapy for allergic asthma. And basically the patients should be evaluated by an allergy specialist they go through their history, they go through a physical exam, they then get diagnostic testing, and they're tested for a variety of things, uh, pollen, animal dander, dust mite, and mold, and, and they look for positive allergic responses. Now, that, that doesn't mean everybody that has positive allergic responses goes on allergy shots. The patient who would go on allergy shots are the ones who are not responding to environmental control measures, are not responding to typical asthma, I mean, allergy and asthma medications. And then allergen immunotherapy becomes a really beneficial uh, management plan for those patients. Allergy shots can reduce the allergic reactions to triggers. They're also known as subcutaneous immunotherapy. It's important to know that allergy injections or shots should be given in a medical clinic. And the reason for that is some patients as they're building on their shots or getting their maintenance, immunotherapy injections can have an acute allergic reaction. And some of these can be very severe like anaphylaxis or severe total body reaction. And they need to be recognized and managed very quickly and appropriately. Um, so that's why we, we do not allow allergy immunotherapy to be given out of a medical facility or, or a clinic. So that's really important to know. And, and people who who have known allergy or known responses to allergens are candidates. Do not, you do not definitely don't want to give uh, allergy shots to people who don't have, have not been documented to have allergy. Now, for the other um, form of treatment, so um, let me, before I get here, so in the, in the recommendations, remember that allergy shots have been recommended when they're appropriate in the patients with allergic asthma. On the other hand, there's sublingual um, immunotherapy or SLIT, and it is not recommended at this time to treat allergic asthma. This is given by a tablet or a drop under the tongue, and, and this, this is a, much different from the injection therapy. It typically is used for patients with allergic rhinitis or hay fever, and not necessarily to treat allergic asthma. So the, the evidence that was reviewed did not support this therapy for allergic asthma, and that's important to know at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. James. Um, that was great information. And now I'm going to go over some of the new recommendations around reducing indoor asthma triggers. So reducing and avoiding asthma triggers is really key to managing asthma. Taking medicines as directed is only one piece of the asthma control puzzle. You also have to identify and reduce your exposures to the things that trigger your asthma. The first step in identifying your triggers is to get allergy tested by a board certified allergist. The second step is to identify and reduce your triggers. AFA has a downloadable asthma-friendly home checklist that you can use to go around your home, identify what might be triggering your asthma, and help you create a plan to reduce those triggers. The link to this resource is being put in the chat. So the work group looked at the data that was available on how well pesticides that kill dust mites are 
working along with air filtration systems, including HEPA filters, different cleaning products, pillow and mattress covers that are dust mite proof, as well as pest management and the removal of mold. What they found was that there was very limited data to show that one step or strategy when used alone is actually successful in reducing allergens. Therefore, a trigger reduction plan that includes more than one strategy is recommended. This is called a multi-component strategy and includes several steps. More studies are needed to determine if and how these strategies help reduce asthma symptoms or triggers. So the new recommendations say that if you don't have symptoms when you are exposed to indoor allergens, or you don't have a known or diagnosed allergy, there is no need for reduction strategies, right? Reduction strategies can take time and cost money, and if you don't have a known allergy, this might not be productive. If you do have symptoms or a known allergy, use this multi-component strategy to reduce those triggers. The work group specifically mentioned that covering your mattress and pillows in dust mite proof covers is not enough to reduce dust mites as a trigger. So they recommend a multi-component strategy, as I've mentioned. You know, you can still encase your mattress and pillow in covers to reduce dust mites, but you also want to wash your bedding weekly in hot water when possible. You want to vacuum weekly with a HEPA filter vacuum, and you want to damp dust. All of these things will help reduce dust mites in your, in your home. Also keep, I'm sorry, also keep pests out of your bedroom and use exhaust, exhaust fans to reduce moisture and avoid mold. So we have another question. Calvin, all the way in Hong Kong, is asking, are air purifiers helpful for people with asthma? And the answer is yes. Air purifiers can be helpful to reduce allergens and pollutants in the air. You want to make sure you choose an air purifier that uses a HEPA filter and does not generate ozone. Ozone can um, irritate all lungs, including healthy lungs. There are so many products out there that promise to help control allergens, but it's hard to know if these products actually live up to their claims. Products with the certified asthma and allergy friendly mark go through rigorous testing to ensure they work as they say they do. At afa.org slash certified, you can find recommended air purifiers, vacuums, and many other products to help create a more asthma and allergy friendly home. So we have one more recommendation to cover, which is integrative pest management as a way to keep your home pest free. It is a multi-component strategy used to reduce pests like mice and cockroaches. So even though it's considered one strategy, it has multi-component steps within that strategy. It includes preventative actions to stop pests from entering and staying in your home without the use of harsh chemicals. Steps include filling holes where mice can get in, taking trash out daily to remove food sources, keeping your kitchen dry to avoid water sources. And most of these action steps are no cost or low cost. You can go to the epa.gov website to find more about integrative pest management strategies. So now I'd just like to go over a few of AFA's resources. Um, we have many resources that can help you manage asthma and allergies. Our online support communities. With the pandemic and people feeling more isolated than ever, online support communities can be a lifeline. Our support community is moderated by staff and volunteers to ensure it remains a respectful and safe place to ask questions and share experiences. We also have an Ask the Allergist feature where members can submit questions to the allergist and get a response within a few days. You can join our online community by going to afa.org slash join. So that concludes today's webinar. We also encourage those watching this chat to stay engaged by continuing the discussion and finding updated resources through our online community. Please follow us on social media at AFA National if you don't already. 
If you sent in a question today that hasn't been answered, we will do our best to answer it soon. We encourage you to sign up for AFA's community for tips to help manage your asthma and allergies. Make sure to go to afaorg slash join. Please complete the short survey that will pop up on your screen when the webinar ends and let us know if you need a certificate of attendance. On behalf of Kenny Mendez, Dr. James, and myself, and everyone at the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, thank you so much for joining in.